while, Brianna Joy Gray and Robbie had the opportunity to interview Vivek Ramaswamy, particularly about his position on foreign policy. I think you're going to hear a lot of words, Sally, come from Vivek, particularly when it comes to what he would do if he were president in reference to this position with Israel and Palestine. So uh, let's go ahead and get into it. I, I think you're in for a good time. Grab some popcorn. Let's go. I have a preference between those paths, but they're at least coherent. One is actually embracing the true Israel first and true America first view. That's what I favor. And the founding of Israel was based on the idea that Israel has an absolute right to national self-existence and to defend itself as it appropriately should. And I stand for that view. Israel's Israel first view. I'm an America first leader of the United States that says every decision I make as the U.S. president is made with a moral obligation to the American people. So let's hold on to that piece right there where he says that he supports the Israel first view. Just hold on to that piece. So what does that mean in terms of policy? I think we should provide Israel a diplomatic iron dome that stops any other country or the UN or anybody else criticizing or getting in the way of Israel, substantively defending its own homeland. That it Pause. So this is the scary part. I hope you guys notice what he just said there that we should supply them with an Iron Dome, that there is an Iron Dome. But what was weird is that he said, not just in reference to Israel defending itself, but in reference to anyone criticizing Israel defending itself. So is Vivek for censorship? Is he for censorship now? You heard that right, folks. Pay attention. Pay attention. This interview is very revealing. Attack by Hamas on Israel, it was inhumane. It was, it was subhuman. It was barbaric. And Israel absolutely has the right to defend itself. And our job can be a diplomatic one to give Israel the air cover that it needs diplomatically to be able to do that. I think that's the cleanest solution for all. I think that we have been wrongfully engaged with military presence in the Middle East for decades that has not served us well. However, if we're, I'm not president yet, if we're going down the path of talking about complex forms of aid, financially or militarily or otherwise, then yes, the U.S., and my job as the U.S. president will have to be to then ask demanding questions about what exactly is the plan for a ground invasion of Gaza? Is it a prolonged conflict? Is it one that results in a likely two-front war that further draws the U.S. in? We have to have clear answers to those questions so that we can clearly state this is what we will and what we won't support. Right now, I'm worried we live in the worst of both worlds, though, which is neither of those two reasonable options. But a third reasonable option that vaguely has some ill-defined financial and military commitments when we don't even understand what exactly those objectives are. Vivek, so long story short, Vivek still supports the Israel first policy. Vivek supports sending funds to Israel. See, this is what I was saying about some of those politicians that were good on Ukraine, but when you change the country to Israel, not so good. So can people stop calling Vivek anti-war now? Because he's not, he's not. Let's continue. So do I think Israel has to answer to the United States? No, Israel doesn't need the US permission to do what it needs to, to advance its own interests, but if there's going to be a serious discussion about U.S. involvement, then yes, it's the job of the U.S. to ask those questions. I think that's a coherent position. It's my view. It's one that probably other Republicans, some of them behind closed doors, would share if they weren't so scared of their own shadows in being labeled anti-Israel if they say this. The irony is that this isn't anti-Israel. This is deeply pro-Israel, aligned with the original founding vision of Israel itself, that it has the right to defend itself. And that's what I stand for. I'm an America first leader. And I endorse Israel pursuing an Israel first agenda as well. So help me under. So just before we get to what Bree says, when he says like he supports Israel, supporting an Israel first uh, agenda as well. Essentially, what he is also saying is he does not support the Palestinian people having that same type of push for their people and their existence. Just understand that, guys. I understand uh, your distinction between yourself and other candidates. It does seem to me that 
constructively, what you're saying is that the U.S. would continue to fund the Iron Dome. Uh, it provides around $3.8 billion of military aid to Israel, including for that purpose, every year. And so it does sound like you're in line with the Republican and Democratic establishment in continuing funding, military right. funding I, I for Israel. Is that, is that right? Yeah, so I, I was using an expression of the diplomatic Iron Dome. So what does was, that mean to you? Of, yeah, it was a turn of phrase. Uh, so, so fair enough. Let me, if it was unclear, let me explain it. What I mean by that is, there's been a long habit of the UN and other institutions pressuring Israel to take steps that would not allow it to fully defend itself, creating a false equivalence between Israel's national self-defense and the actions of Hamas or the other terrorists who target Israel. So my view is we should diplomatically, as a matter of diplomacy, stand publicly at the UN or otherwise in favor of Israel's ability to come to its own national self-defense. Okay, I think I understand. Without any, yeah, yeah, without any U.S. involvement. So, you know, there's the physical Iron Dome. I use the phrase the diplomatic Iron Dome, providing that level of diplomatic air cover. Right. So he's talking in circles because in one point here, he says no U.S. involvement, but then he also said before that, that he supports the U.S., you know, obviously funding Israel and, and helping. So... I just want people to pay attention to the way that when it comes to this particular topic, he kind of talks in circles. Because I want to be very clear, I want people to understand, he is not saying that he doesn't want the U.S. to still support Israel. He still wants the U.S. to support Israel. But what he's also saying at the same time is that Israel should be able to make their own, their own decisions and their own choices. But he's not saying that he wants the U.S. to not support Israel. Just pay attention to that, guys. That's so my follow-ups would then be, would you then cut funding? Would you stop funding Israel to the tune of about 3 to $4 billion a year, the way we have been doing historically? And also on the point of uh, what the perhaps limits of Israel's right to defend itself, the question on the international community and at, before the U.N. is whether or not Israel's acts are in fact in self-defense for two reasons. One is that at this point, there has been a disproportionate response when you look at the number of people killed in the horrific events of October 7th, which is around 1,400 Israelis, versus now verging on 6,000 uh, 6, people of Gaza, uh, innocent women, children, civilians that have been killed in that attack. Is it the case that at some point, Israel's actions against uh, got the got people of Gaza is no longer rightly considered to be self-defense in a way that would then justify the UN's attempt at having a humanitarian pause that the U.S. did veto. So I reject both the left-wing criticism as well as the neocon bloodthirst here. The left-wing criticism, though, is this idea of proportionality. I reject that because it almost pretends as though those things were happening at the same time. They weren't. Israel was struck, minding its own business, struck let me pause there. Uh, there is no minding its own business because I can use that same analogy in reference to the Palestinian people going back to 1948. I could easily say, well, you know, in the 40s, the Palestinian people were minding their own business. And then they were then pushed out of their homes. I could say that. I could say killed, beaten, pushed out of their homes and pushed into open air prison. So how far are we going to take this? Somebody was minding their own business. And have they really been minding their own business when they can cr control the resources that actually go into Gaza and they can cut off the resources whenever they want to? You see how he's framing this? By a terrorist group, really, that killed thousand plus innocent civilians. And so Israel absolutely has a right to fully send a deterrent signal to make sure that can never happen again. But the Palestinian people didn't have a right to do that when it was done to them from the get go. I want to be clear about what's being said here, guys. When the Palestinian people were pushed out of their homes, which still was happening in 2021, I saw them doing this on the news, dragging people out of their homes at gunpoint, pushing them to live in an open air prison. Did the Palestinian people, did they have a right to push back and defend their self? According to what Vivek and other politicians are saying, no, they didn't. Some of these same people 
would have been against the Haitian slave revolt. Some of them would have been against that. Although they applaud it and sometimes say, yes, they rose up and, you know, they did this. But what they're telling you is that the Palestinian people had the right to be occupied. That's what they're telling you. And they're purposely only going back to October 7th because they don't want to talk about the history. Because if you start talking about the history, which explains how we got here, then that can hurt you in reference to donors and that can hurt you on the campaign trail because then people are going to tell you, oh, no, no, we're not going to get into all that. That's just being, you're just being anti-Semitic. That's what they're going to tell you. Are there any limits but on that? My view is, what's that? Are there any limits on that signal? For example, if they were that's to for Israel kill to determine. every, that's for the, I'm sorry, that's for, if they were to kill is, every Gaza, for, for instance. So the, with the U.S. backing and support, the international but, community in the U.S. should stand by, just hypothetically, but if all this is where I come out, though, to be consistent. were killed. But this is where I come out, this is where I just want to come out to be consistent. This is exactly why I think the U.S. should not be engaged militarily. So, if the U.S. is engaged militarily, then, so, so the well, question well, I, then is, if is Israel using U.S. tax dollars were to do something in violation of uh, international law, like killing every Gazan, or let's use an example that's currently ongoing since that obviously hasn't happened. But Israel's not doing well, that. Right no, now. that's why I said let's use an example that's actually happening, which is the collective punishment. That is cutting off um, gas, medical supplies, water, et cetera, to the entire population in violation of the Geneva Convention, is that not the role of the U.S. or the international community to say that we don't want, at very least, American tax dollars going to continue that? And we should note that there's been an ongoing occupation of Gaza that preceded, of course, this conflict. And I would, I'm curious to know whether you support U.S. tax dollars going on to, you know, enabling what 18, inter 18 international humanitarian organizations have described as an apartheid state. So I think that a lot of those are unfair, inaccurate, and wrong descriptions of Israel. And I no, they're not. See, this is the part they don't want to, like Vivek doesn't want to discuss. They don't want to talk about the history because it, it ex exposes things, right? It is an apartheid state. So you mean to tell me 18 humanitarian organizations are incorrect? He don't want to answer that question. What she's asking him is, would you support U.S. funds going towards participating in an apartheid state, which humanitarian organizations have called out in reference to the state of Israel? Also, militarily. He said he doesn't think the U.S. Military, militarily should get involved, but he agrees with them funding the, the weapons and stuff to Israel. So you are involved militarily. So which is it? Let me let him finish. I stand by that, and that's what I mean by when I talk about the diplomatic Iron Dome. As U.S. leader, I will, as the leader of the United States, as the U.S. president, I will be crystal clear that Israel defending its own borders, that's exactly what I believe Israel is, been, is doing and has been doing. The fence around Gaza is not a border. A fence is not a border. So people need to stop pretending like that is a border is absolutely defensible. Israel should pursue an Israel first agenda. It has a right to national self-existence. But I think it is easier for me to do that as US president if we don't muddy the waters by getting involved militarily or financially or otherwise. So see, you guys see, this is what I was trying to tell you. This is why she exposed him when she did the follow-up question. Because at the very beginning of this video, he agreed to the funding. He agreed to help with the funding. Now he's saying he doesn't want to do the funding or militarily. So what are you talking about, Vivek? This is where he gets caught. That's why I said it's titled Brianna Joy Gray Exposes Vivek because he's just talking around in like one big circle. I don't think when it comes to this issue, like I said, he was good on the Ukraine issue in reference to don't give Ukraine funding. And here's the reason why. But when it comes to this particular issue, I don't think he gets this. Well, I don't think he knows much about the history. If he does know about the history, he's pretending like he doesn't. But I don't think he he's I don't think he's good at explaining his position on this, whatever it appears to be. We've made commitments in the past. I always stand by those commitments. Those run through 2028. But my point is, in the context of this war, look at the $16 billion aid in the $106 billion aid package that's now making its way through Congress. I don't think it's a good idea for the U.S. to further engage financially or militarily 
But the flip side of that is that Israel is absolutely free to pursue what it believes to be in its own national self-interest, just as every other nation is free to do the same thing. My job but every other nation isn't free to do the same thing. That's the, that's the thing, Vivek. You know that. <laughs> every other nation isn't free to do the same thing because of U.S. intervention. Every other nation isn't even free to elect their own leaders because of U.S. intervention in those countries that have known to go in and topple leaders in an effort for regime change. I think that this was a very revealing interview. I really do. I don't think he was ready for this. job as the United States president is to the people of this country. The My exclusive obligation as the next president is to Americans here in the homeland. And that's how I'm going to lead this country accordingly, which is why I'm against the neocon call as well to willy nilly provide aid. It muddies the waters. It creates loss of clarity that then commits us to have to make judgments that should not be the U.S.'s judgments to make. I really, Those should be Israel's sorry. judgment on how it defends itself. The uh, let me pause here, and then we're going to fast forward to the next part uh, that Bree says. So you guys know he's exposed, right? You know he's, he show, he exposed himself. Let me get to this next part because there's another question um, that Bree comes back to. And while we're waiting for that, whoops, I slid off here. Here we go. While we're waiting for this, another thing that I was going to add as well that I think is really important. Notice how he keeps saying I'm focused on America first and I'm running, I'm president of this country, right? I will be president of this country. Totally get that. Get where you're coming from, right? Focusing on home base first. But the reality is as president of the United States, part of your job is commander in chief. Part of your job is going to be dealing with foreign policy. So you can't just say, well, my agenda is to focus on America first. If you're coming into the presidency, which will be the beginning of 2025, January, 2025, we are already involved in two conflicts. You have Russia and Ukraine and you have Israel and Palestine. So there's two international conflicts that have started under Joe Biden's uh, administration you are going to have to make decisions in reference to those two conflicts and foreign policy in general. So for you to just throw that back and push back and say, I'm worried about Americans first. No, yeah, you can say that, but you still have to be commander in chief. That is still part of the job. So you will have to make a decision in reference to Israel and Palestine. So you can't keep using that excuse. Let's get to this part here as well. This issue, I wonder if you could elaborate on what your views are of the issue and what's driving the conflict uh, in Israel and Palestine at this moment. I wonder if you could speak specifically to the ongoing uh, occupation in uh, Gaza. What, if any, you, anything you see as the solution to those people who feel as though they've been pushed from their lands and kept in what has been described uh, by a former Israeli prime minister as an open air prison, what to do in the West Bank about the encroaching settlements that are also in violation of international law and whether you agree with Joe Biden as he continues to push for a two state solution. So this is based because she's asking him about the occupation. So my view here is simply grounded in, again, principle. I'm an America first conservative. My moral obligation is to the citizens of this country. I think that that is perfectly legitimate for every other nation, including Israel, to pursue an Israel first policy. But what about the people Israel of Israel has a right to exist. What's that? What about Palestinians? Do they also have a right to exist? Well, they have a right to exist, but I think that they don't have a right to attack Israel in these, in these dastardly attacks that have taken place serially. You guys see the problem, right? So notice how when, and by the way, this, this part right here may work against him on both sides because he admitted to that the Palestinians have a right to exist too. Some people will say that that's anti-Semitic, by the way. I don't think it is, but some people will. But you guys see the problem? He's like, Israel has a right to exist. What about the Palestinians? Well, they also have a right to exist, but they don't have the right to attack Israel. But Israel has the right to attack them. You guys see the problem with this statement? This is what he's basically saying. Israel has a right to cut off their water, cut off their electricity, cut off the food supply, 
keep them in an open air prison, but they don't have the right. They don't have the right to push back against any of that. They can't defend their self. But Israel has the right to attack and to defend itself. And to put Israel on the defensive. Absolutely, but, but I would like my to view, avoid it. My view is, I'm, I'm, we're not having this discussion in the Middle East, we're having it here. My view is the U.S. needs to get the heck out of poking its nose into other people's business on the other side of the world. I mean, part of the reason that you even now have bases in places like Iraq or in Syria that are at risk of supposedly being attacked in this conflict is the problem that we shouldn't have been there in the first place. So my view is a broader disengagement in the Middle East is actually the right answer for the U.S. I'm not but if you're coming in as president in 2025, the United States has a relationship with the state of Israel in reference to funding. They fund Israel. You know, they have health care. Everybody has health care there. From what I understand, everybody don't have health care here. So there, there is a financial relationship with the U.S. and the state of Israel that is established. And there is also aid that has gone to Israel that already is established. So when you come in as president, Vivek, these relationships already exist. So if you don't want to focus on any of the other countries or have anything to do with foreign policy, so to speak, which I don't really believe is true, or anything to do with foreign policy, so to speak, then you only want to do part of the job. You just want to do the domestic part of the presidential position. You don't want to do the commander in chief part. That is part of the role. See, this is why some people believe, and this is something a friend of mine used to say. This is why some people believe that in order for you to run to pres for president, you should have to have some type of either military experience or foreign policy experience. This is why some people believe that. Because Vivek thinks he can just walk and go sit in the White House and not have to deal with international politics at all. I'm just going to focus on the U.S. I'm not going to worry about any of these other countries that we already have relationships with. So is Vivek going to cut off all of the financial relationships and investments that we have with other countries? Because once he does that, then the U.S. will no longer be an ally with those countries. How would that affect NATO? These are things to think about, folks. I'm not running for president of the world. I'm running for president of the United States of America. Well, it, and I think we have yeah. to have discipline in addressing everything through what addresses, what really relates to the interests of Americans here in the homeland. So well, with all, with that's the way I will respect, lead this country. And I want to be disciplined about that. With all respect, Vivek, I, I do think that some people very much see our foreign policy as one of the key responsibilities of the president of the United States of America. It is. And in included in that is our enormous veto power that we have in the United Nations, the incredible power that we have over foreign uh, economies through uh, direct diplomacy and also through tools like the IMF and the World Bank, et cetera. And so if your position is simply a, a truly isolationist one that the U.S. will no longer have any involvement in global affairs, that is a somewhat radical position to take and, and something that's a little bit different from saying that I'm going to act internationally in America's best interest. Do you see the difference there? And so what I'm asking well, you is- Well, it is, and, and, and I've never said that I want to disengage from global affairs. I think the real threat that we face is communist China. And every iota of military or economic attention that we're miring ourselves into conflicts in the Middle East with is one that leaves us weaker in deterring China from, say, annexing Taiwan, which right now, as we depend on Taiwan for semiconductors, absolutely affects the American way of life. So I think the fact that China- so see, he does, see, this is the problem with this candidate, man. This is the problem with this guy, because again, it's like, we don't need to have anything to do with these other countries. We don't need to take any position or anything in reference to Israel. We're just America first and that's it. But now when you mention China, all of a sudden it's, oh, well, actually, you know, uh, I think we should be involved in geopolitics. There's this issue with China and Taiwan and da, da, da. You all over the place, man. You are all over the place. Like, this is a mess. I don't even know what Vivek is running on anymore. Yeah. As pumping fentanyl across our southern border using the Mexican drug cartels as a vehicle to do it is killing Americans right here at home. Yeah. A Chinese spy balloon flying over half this country. Yes, these are international issues that deeply matter to the United States.
the balloon that they came back and actually corrected and said it was a weather balloon, Vivek? But my view is we have to look at global affairs through the prism of what affects Americans rather than to be the global international yeah. police. I, I, I've I also think, been very open about yeah. questioning the wisdom of our continued involvement in the UN. I think the UN is a joke when you think about Venezuela or other countries like even North Korea staffing the Human Rights Council at the UN. This makes absolutely no sense that and if the UN or any other institution has outlived its purpose, the WHO, I will question continued funding or U.S. involvement in any international institution that impedes U.S. sovereignty. So, so just so, so my I view understand, is just we have to, put to look a at this on, through the prism of yeah. U.S. interests. That's where I stand. So just to put a button on it, is it in U.S. interests to cut funding to Israel? The three over three billion dollars of funding that Israel, uh, that U.S. gives to Israel every year. I understand your ideological position that they can do what they want as a country. But that is complicated by any U.S. funding. So yep. I, I, I'm unclear about your distinction between you and the rest of the Republican field. They all still want to continue they're, they're, to fund The distinction is you? clear. That's why they're all attacking me. But, that's, but, that, but put that to one side. My view is the U.S. should focus on actually addressing the real threat we face. That's communist China. So that's cutting funding to strategy. Israel or no? Now it's China's the... You guys see this guy's all first. He said just U.S. America first. Now it's the U.S. should focus on China. So now we should focus on another country. You know what? Hold on. Because this is just this is just an absolute, an absolute mess. So she's asking him again. Should the U.S. cut aid to Israel? Well, we have to stand by commitments we've already made. We're committed for how long? 2028. Well, we, so you we're, will continue we're to fund, fund Israel at current levels until, until 2028. I stand by every commitment that we've made. I mean, if the U.S. There you go, folks. There it is. You don't even need to see anymore. There it is, folks. <laughs> he stands by every commitment that the U.S. has already made. So what he is saying is if he were to win the presidency, he would still fund Israel and any other commitment financially that the U.S. government has made with other countries. So there it is, folks. There it is. We made a commitment. We're going to stand by that commitment. And I further said that we would only cut aid to Israel when Israel tells us that they're ready to have that aid cut. Which why would Israel tell you guys? Let me give me a second. He said. We would only cut aid to Israel when Israel tells us they want aid cut. Why would they tell you to stop giving them? Who comes up to? Why would they come to the U.S. and say, we don't want you to give us any more aid? Why would they do that? Who does this? Who says this? No, nah, man, don't give me no more, man. Don't give me no more. We all good. We all set. This is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Who comes up with this? I think is in the interests of both the U.S. and Israel why? for the U.S. not to be dictating what Israel's foreign policy is. I why think Israel is it in, absolutely in, why has isn't the right America, to defend Can you help us understand why it's in America's interest to fund uh, Israel to the tune of over $3 billion a year, especially since so many Americans are increasingly concerned about the humanitarian abuses that are befalling on the people of Palestine with U.S. tax dollars? Well, I think the humanitarian abuses are in reverse. Look at what Hamas just did to Israel. But our reason for having Israel as a that doesn't make any sense. He thinks that the humanitarian abuses are worse on the Israeli side. They control all the resources. They control the food and everything. So this is just, this is crazy shit, man. The stable allies, first of all, a lot of that aid has run through the United States, our industrial capacity and intelligence sharing agreement that has been helpful to the United States between the U.S. and Israel and a reliable partner in the Middle East, a region of the world where we don't have other reliable partners. But at the same time, I believe in this conflict. It's funny, I, you know, not very long ago, earlier this morning, <laughs> I'm having arguments with neoconservatives on the other end of the spectrum that are hitting me from exactly the opposite angle. It, it's interesting to, there's an interesting discussion that's complementary to that one. The reality is I stand affirmatively for Israel's right to fully defend itself to the fullest and to make Israel first decisions. And the problem is we're muddying the waters with the $16 billion aid package 
that isn't a prior commitment that we've made, but that is making its way through Congress now that I think is a bad idea. So my view is that we actually do better when we're not engaged in the Middle East. There's a, I'm not saying it's a comfortable balance of power, but you have the Arab nations, you've got the Turks, you've got Israel, all of whom have deep interest in making sure that Iran does not expand its power in the region. That's not something the U.S. should actually make worse. And I think every time we've tried to involve ourselves, we've made ourselves and the situation in the Middle East worse off for it. When, in fact, we have a real concern to face off with, that's China, the rise of communist China, who we depend on for our modern way of life. That combined to our own homeland security here. We're vulnerable to border incursions, cyber attacks, super EMP electromagnetic pulse attacks in this country, missile attacks in this country, protect this homeland, declare independence from China, avoid World War III. That's my foreign policy focus. And I do not think U.S. engagement in another no-win war in the Middle East is going to do us any good. That's why I've been alone in the GOP, actually, in identifying and staking out that position. He could have said all that in five minutes. He could have just answered all this in five minutes. He's just been talking in circles most of the interview. But the thing is, is this that I want to drive home. He's going to continue to fund Israel. OK, <laughs> that word salad that he gave you there, he's going to continue to fund Israel. And the other thing is that he feels like China is a really big threat. So when he talks about I'm just going to focus on America first and he brings up this issue of we depend on China. Well, maybe instead of you targeting China uh, for being successful, maybe the focus should be on building infrastructure and building things here in the United States again so that we don't have to depend on China. Just a thought, just a thought. Let me go to some of the comments. Ay, 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 I don't know what he's running on anymore. Thank you for the super chat, American Autopsy. They assassinated Thomas Sankara for the same reason later killed, or for the same reason they later killed Gaddafi. Interesting. Thank you for the super chat, Janice. Congress funding slash arming Israel violates both national and international law. It's an occupying force, totally illegal to fund and arm occupation. Mm hmm. Thank you for the super chat, Barack. See, I told you Vivek was a snake. JB says this guy is trying to keep Zionists happy while sounding different, but he can't. Mm hmm. Thank you, uh, Zakir. Vivek needs a DJ for these nonsensical freestyle sessions. And thank you, Frank. I love Brie. The way she buries Vivek love. Thank you so much for that, Frank. By the way, in reference to Israel and Palestine, where is DJ Khaled? Have you guys heard DJ Khaled say anything, anything about this issue? No? Are we no longer the best, DJ Khaled? No? All right. But there was a poll, you guys answered it in reference to uh, Vivek Ramaswamy. Eric, I'll take that poll whenever you're ready. Do you trust Vivek Ramaswamy foreign policy position? We have 840, excuse me, 852 votes. 5% said, yes, I trust his position. 79% said, no, I don't trust his position. 6% said, I trust it a little bit. And 10% said, I am not sure. 